Welcome to season one of the all new Easy Street Show TV. I really appreciate you tuning in. Hey, listen, I decided to do something new, man. I've been on the radio in DC for over 20 years. I decided I was gonna take it to TV, so I hope you enjoy my new show. Now, uh, not only just myself, but I know you are trying to take yourself to the next level, right? I spoke to motivational speaker by the name of Eric E.T. Thomas, who's traveling the country, he's doing some great work. He'll be on the show today. Now, a couple of blocks from where I'm standing right here in Southeast, there was an event at Union Temple Baptist Church called Preserve the Go-Go Panel Discussion, uh, hosted by myself. Some of the top Go-Go band members and promoters and fans of Go-Go came together to talk about how we could preserve Go-Go. And finally, on today's show, an exclusive interview with Iggy Azalea. What's going on with her and Nick? Well, she said if she caught him cheating again that she would, you know, cut him off. Literally. I asked her how she was going to do that. So that's all straight ahead on the brand new Easy Street Show TV. Enjoy. This Grammy-nominated, Australian-born female rapper hit on February 2014 in a major way and smashed the scene with her hit single, Fancy. Fancy broke chart history. Number one on the Billboard Hot 100 for seven weeks. The longest streak ever for a female rapper. Then the shade. What I want the world to know about Nicki Minaj is when you hear Nicki Minaj spit, Nicki Minaj wrote it. Of course, Iggy responded by saying, Nicki Minaj didn't write her own raps. That didn't go over too well. And all that was nothing compared to just recently. L.A. Laker D'Angelo Russell, a teammate of her fiance, Nick Young, outed Nick in a video ex exposing Nick as a cheater. Iggy stopped by the studio. We talked about that. Plus, I wanted to get to know her better, so we talked about a whole lot more. Let's throw it back. Because uh, me personally, and I, these questions are, are from me because... I don't know a lot about you mm -hmm, yeah. and your, your early... We know you're from Australia. Yes. But how did you get into rap in the first place? You know what? I always grew up listening to rap, of course, because I'm from the age of the internet. And we had rap just like you guys did on the radio or the Top 40 Countdown. Um, but as far as me like taking an interest or really feeling passionate about rap music, I actually heard the Tupac song, Baby Don't Cry, at a friend's house down the street who had an older brother who was really into rap music and I heard him playing it and I just fell in love with the song. And so that really made me take a bigger interest in hip hop music beyond just hearing it on the radio or hearing what was popular and actually taking interest and going and finding different rappers that you might not see on that countdown that, that you like. What is the grind like for an MC coming out of Australia? It's really different because here I feel like every, you know, Everybody has like their local rap scene and in Australia it's you might be the only person for miles and miles that even likes rap music or wants to rap so there's not like really enough people trying to do it for you to have those kind of like events or festivals or things like that that are just dedicated to hip hop in Australia although there are a lot of people that like the music you really have to be from a bigger city to be able to have that like community mm -hmm. um, and I'm from a really small town with only 2,000 people in it but for me it was always about the bigger picture and I felt like I wanted to come to America where of course rap music is born and I just really wanted to have you, that like real life experience with it instead of seeing it on television um because we all know that's not like 100 percent real so do you remember TV. your very first time at a real rap concert a, well the or first rap concert funnily enough that i the first concert i ever went to this is really funny and kind of embarrassing was 50 cent uh the no fear no mercy tour in 2003 that was the first concert i ever went to and i'm young i was only 13 where was that was that on the, the west coast or was that it, no it was in brisbane in australia oh, and they came over there yeah 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 we have rap concerts too okay um, oh, excuse me damn yeah yeah not often my bad well when they come when a rapper <laughs> comes like you know you have to go i remember going and seeing jay-z when he came to australia and i it was one of the many times that he had said that he was going to retire and i like believed and i was like i got to get to this rap it concert worked. yeah because i was like i'm never going to be able to see jay-z perform live ever which would be like the worst thing ever so i was like i gotta get to this concert but the tickets were so much money they're like $120 just to get a ticket. That's a lot. And I'm from a small town, so we don't have public transport or anything. So you have to find a way to get like two and a half hours into the city to see this concert. And I remember I went, I saw the concert, like Rihanna opened for him. It was amazing. And then uh, I went by myself 
because I just had to go. So what was going through your mind when you saw them on stage? Did you think of like, maybe I want to be up there one day? Yeah, of course. It's like larger than life. It's funny because the same arena that I watched those guys in, I actually ended up coming back around to uh, back in 2013. I, I had the pleasure of opening for Beyonce. That's dope. Um, in Australia. How did that, and that, talk about that experience right oh, there. Oh, it was amazing. Of course, it was amazing. But it, it's crazy because... The night that I performed in what would what was that same place that I watched Jay Z play, and it's kind of like the closest thing to my hometown. So there are a lot of people in the crowd with signs to me and stuff. And the same day, I cracked my tooth, my wisdom tooth, and I had to get my wisdom tooth mm. removed, and then go on stage the same night. So I was like sitting backstage with my mouth full of like you know the stuffing they Damn. put in there. Like, is somebody gonna? That's crazy. Should I go on stage? Why just gotta I happen not? on this day? Exactly, but you can't. <laughs> cancel on Beyonce. I feel like if she had like a broken leg, she would still go on stage and Absolutely. like do her full dance routine. We're glad that you and Nick are still together. Yes, yes. No, that's a good thing. Good yeah. to sort things out. I went on the internet and I saw some of your other interviews mm-hmm. and I heard that you said if he does it again, he that you're going to cut off his penis. Yes. Now, <laughs> did you mean that first of all? Um, well, for his sake, I meant it. <laughs> Have you thought about how you would do it? Would, are you gonna wait till he sleep or? Probably with scissors. Scissors? Yeah, I think so. Like the ones you cut up. Are you gonna it. wait till he goes to sleep? Is it gonna be after basketball practice? I like gonna... to do stuff to him when he goes to sleep, just to freak him out. Like if I'm gonna like confront someone in an argument, I like to wait till they go to sleep and then wake them up out of their sleep with the argument. That's what real crazy people do. Like, don't confront someone while they're awake. If you want the maximum shock value, wait till the person's asleep and then be like, hey, what are you doing? I see this. Ah! And then they'll really wake up like, oh! It's actually the, sca- what, this is the scariest thing you can do. So if you ever want to confront your boyfriend with any anything, ladies, wait till they're asleep. And then at like 2.30 in the morning when they're in a really good deep sleep, just like wake them up with like craziness. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I think all men go through that at one moment in life with some woman. I think there's nothing worse than waking up. It's good to wake people up out of their sleep and then confront them and stuff because they're still asleep, so it takes them longer to, like, get their lies together. Exactly! Yeah, so you'll know if someone's telling the truth or not if they just woke up because if it was if it's truth, they'll just they, they'll already have the information. But otherwise, that's like, wait, uh, 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 they can't think of their life fast enough. So Is she you know. preaching right now the book of Iggy? The book of Iggy! Ladies love that. (laughs) Fellas, we hate it. Coming up next on the all-new Easy Street Show TV, motivational speaker Eric E.T. Thomas. You at the gate right now? You at elevator? Okay, come over to the tunnel. Hey, don't worry about somebody doing something, y'all. Harm y'all around here. They got the garage on lockdown. So before we start talking about what you're doing now, and you're doing some incredible things, we see you all over the internet, of course. Uh, you got some great motivational stuff that's happening uh, for the world, and, and the food that you're putting out, the, the food that you're putting out there right now is delicious. Wow. Let's talk about your humble beginnings, man. Yeah, well, um, you know, man, I always tell people, you know, man, it just. You know, just like so many cats whose father wasn't in his life, just I didn't have a direction, man. My mom got pregnant when I was when she was 17 years old. Uh, my grandma kicked her out. You know, it wasn't about love. My grandma had 14 kids on the south side of Chicago, two bedroom house, one bathroom. You know, so my grandma was like, I can't afford to feed another mouth. And so my mom was homeless, you know, trying to find her way. So here's a 17 year old kid, you know, having a kid, you know, so. Um, just when you know, when kids say I started from the bottom, now we here. Well, my bottom started a generation before my bottom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, so mom found her way, man. End up, you know, get, uh, finishing high school, getting a job uh, as a photographer for the government, and then she ended up moving uh, to Detroit later on and got a job with Ford Motor Company and headquarters. So she eventually got married, and my mom didn't tell me who my father was, and that's really where the anger began. I found out when I was. 12, you know, who my real father was. And I was one of those kids that had three grandmas, so I knew Sesame Street, you know, one of these grandmas don't belong. You know what I'm saying? So um, I got into it with my mom, like, why could you, why did you lie to me? Left home at 14, came back and forth, and at 16, I left for good. So I was living in abandoned buildings, you know, on the west side of Detroit, eating out of garbage cans. And then I had a mentor, a pastor who came into my life when I was about 17. 
you know, uh, helped me get to college. Tell us the story of the idea of even becoming a motivational speaker and traveling around and doing this, man. Where did that come from? So when I was in college, um, I think my freshman year, um, a part of our English assignment was to watch the Eyes on the Prize series. I didn't know who Mega Evers was. I'm, I'm watching my man do his thing, Marcus Garvey. I had never heard of Marcus Garvey a day in my life. Malcolm X, you know, I'm, I'm watching these dudes, Martin Luther King, you know, and they, they breaking down the history. Uh, I'm looking at Sojourner Truth, you know, Harriet Tubman, Rosa Parks. So when I start reading that kind of stuff, I was like, wow, look at the positive impact these dudes are having. I want to be like that. So I didn't really see uh, Dr. J and go, I can hoop, I can hoop. I didn't see Tony Dorsett and say, I could play football. But when I saw Mega Evans, I can't explain it to you. When I saw Malcolm, I felt like, yo, I could do that. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I could do that right there. Like, I can't hoop. But I promise you, you give me a mic, mm -hmm. I can talk like that. I can influence people in a positive way. And I remember my first message, I'm going to be honest, I was raw. You know what I'm saying? My first. Yeah, what did you say in that first message? Yeah, my That's first, what I was about yeah, to ask you about My that. first message was, pimping ain't easy, but somebody's got to do it. That was my first message. <laughs> pimping ain't easy, but somebody got to do it. And what I was saying was, you know, that many of us are being pimped. You know, we're not going to school. We're not educating ourselves. We're not handling our business. We're getting pimped. Right. And so it was raw because that was like a, a university. So they weren't really used to that. But I saw dudes respond like, yo, E, that's raw, but that's real. Right. Like, I ain't never heard it like that before. I've never I've never put myself in that place before. And while the, while the university administrators weren't like, hey, the students was like, yo, E, that's fire. And I saw dudes who wouldn't normally respond to chapel in a good way. Every time I spoke, they was like, I gotta be there. So I knew I had something, knew I had to work on it. I had to hone my craft a little bit, but I knew it was something that when I would do, I would just like light up. I would just goosebumps. I just felt, yeah, I felt good every time I was in that space. Talk about the importance of those two things, the commitment and the dedication for someone that's listening and hearing this right now so they can be able to take themselves to the Absolutely. next level. Absolutely. Well, this is what I believe. I believe that there are certain things that come to you as the level of commitment grows. So I've got this speech that I do where I talk about when you give in low engagement and low risk, the return is going to be low. But when you give high risk and high engagement, the return is going to be high. And there's some people like, why am I not getting the big gig? You ain't making the big commitment. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Why am I not getting the opportunity that he's getting? Because you're not making the sacrifices he's making. You can't ask for what my man is asking for if you're not making the sacrifices my man making. So so Michael Jordan, uh, he the best ever. Yes, but nobody says Mike was always the first one there to practice. He was the last one to leave. Nobody says Jerry Rice was always practicing two hours before practice and then another two hours after practice. I want to be like Mike. No, you don't. You want what Mike has, but you don't want Mike's grind. Right. So, so in order to get to the next level, there is a commitment that you have to make. You got to be careful when you do a lot of talking because when you talk, somehow this generation gets off on talking. And so when they talk, they get the same feeling, the same euphoric feeling that a person who gets a reward from grinding gets. You know what I'm saying? So they feel the same way. Like, I grind and succeed. They feel the same way talking about it. Mm -hmm. So they're sitting there talking to their homeboy about they get, it. They're getting all the feelings. Yeah. They geeked up about mm -hmm. it. They, and then, so they that's don't realize enough, that they don't realize that that's why you're not going to make it happen because you sat there and got all pumped up about when you should have reserved that for doing. So for me, I tell them, don't post until you do. Like, what would the world look like if you didn't if you didn't post until you actually did it? Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you didn't get it, if you didn't get to put up all that talking, you had to perform first, then you put up, right? Then you would do it. Why? Because you don't get to talk. So that's what I tell people, bro. Like, look, execution is worship. Ain't nobody, everybody got an idea. Everybody got a dream. This world worship people that execute, that get it done. Coming up next on the all new Easy Street Show TV, we're live from Southeast at Union Temple for a Preserve the Go-Go panel discussion. It was September the 24th, 2010. Summertime in the city with the godfather of go-go, Chuck Brown, performing live. A free show at the Reagan Building in downtown D.C. And the weather was perfect. D. Floyd, Miss Kim, KK, nothing but legends on the stage. Even the mayor was on the stage cranking with the band. And the crowd, extremely diverse. 
I was amazed, but this was something normal for Chuck Brown. He was an icon, a legend, the man that created Go-Go. But now, Chuck is gone, and the culture is struggling. But not because Chuck Brown passed, but for other reasons. First and foremost, we gotta remember Go-Go, this is not music, you know what I'm saying? We're a culture. I'm doing this because I got love for it. The politicians make like this is the thing but there's no policies, no programs. These original songs, these original pieces, that has to come back into play. It's not being played enough on the radio. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna be honest with you, that's any station. Brothers and sisters, put your head together and come up with a way to take this music to the next level. Do not, do not hear me, do not let this music die. Particularly as it relates to a period that we're living in right now when gentrification and classism and racism are abounding, not only in the nation's capital, but all over this nation. It is important that we ensure that things that are part of our history and our culture and our heritage be maintained and sustained. Particularly as it relates to music, generally speaking, quite often our music even, as are so many other things, is either co-opted or aborted. Uh, by others. Uh, first of all, I'm a Washingtonian, born and raised. Um, started a band called Backyard as a little kid, just following behind Junkyard, just wanting to be somebody in life. And um, I've been fighting for this music since a little guy. And it's just a breath of fresh air that we're having this panel tonight to see that somebody is concerned about our music that we created. I believe that, you know, we've been scapegoated for the past 30 years. Um, just, just like the gun lobby likes to keep statistics away from um, the general population for their agenda, um, there are no real statistics that are out there if you look to say uh, how many homicides are happening in go-go's as opposed to just in the general community. But I did my own research. And last year, 2015, there were 162 murders in D.C. And out of all of those murders, five of them happened at nightclubs, three of them were go-go's. So I did the math, that's 3%. So you can't prove causality and say that go-go music causes violence. Go-go music is just as much a victim of what's going on in our city as far as our problems with conflict, conflict resolution. It happens with a lot of urban music, and I also research, it's not just happening with Go-Go, by the way. Anything that, anywhere where we gather as a people, whether it's hip-hop clubs in other cities, or Go-Go here in D.C., the clubs are being shut down, they're not addressing the real issues that are going on in the community, the pro pro proliferation of guns and everything else. Um, they just want to scapegoat. If anything happens, it's blown up on every news channel. We just had a person get killed in barcode. No go-go around. You ain't heard it like two or three times. If anything would have happened with go-go, it would have been on every city paper, Washington paper, Washington Post, everything. And preserving go-go and trying to get it together, we have, we vote for these politicians, these council members, they get our vote, but then they don't fight for us when it comes time to put the boxing gloves on. We are broadcasting live from Union Temple Baptist Church. This is a discussion about preserving go-go, uh, and we have uh, a comment. Uh, as far as the stigma, one is our perception. We perceive, the go-go community is perceived as um, non-taxpaying hoodlums, mm -hmm. and on the business side is pimps and hustlers. Mm -hmm. So one, the way you know, to come up with a solution, one thing we have to do is, that's the importance of, of voter registration. But we need to begin to exercise the political might. And that means more importantly that the go-go community comes together and creates a bond and a pact that begins to work towards creating those vehicles that create the image that we need. Whatever happened to the go-go coalition? What happened to the Go-Go Coalition was Go-Go. Go-Go yeah. didn't take care of the Go-Go Coalition. We got to stop pointing fingers, yes. blaming others, when the biggest problem is in the mirror. Mm -hmm. What we didn't do with our greatest problem, in addition to the PR problem, or lack thereof, 
is that we didn't do a sustained effort. When these things happen, when these incidents happen at our nightclubs, um, we need to uh, have our own press releases. We need to engage with our elected officials before something happens and be proactive. Um, Big Young, you touched on an important thing is the business. As far as musicians, learn the business, learn how to protect your publication, learn how to get your distribution. If you tell me somebody about to set me up, I'm either going to do one or two things. I'm either going to go a different way, or I'm going to get myself together so I'm ready for when, them when they come. And I'm going to call my cousin, I'm going to call G, I'm going to call all y'all. And when we go down there, they think they setting us up, and we setting them up. And we about to put the hammers to them. I got anybody in here know what I'm talking about? Go, go community has got to get yourself together and stop running from it and run to it and put the head, but you can only do it what? Together. All right, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in to Easy Street Show TV. I appreciate you. Don't forget, you can see all the episodes on my website at easystreetshow.com. Don't forget to follow on Twitter and Instagram at Easy Street. And we promise at the end of every show, a live performance from an artist from the DMV. Hey, it's your girl Mika. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Officially Mika. That's Officially Mika, and this is Easy Street Show TV. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, this what y'all want, huh? You got me back on my old dog and my young bitch yelling out, go hard. Church ladies fainting like Olaf. What you trying to keep me low for? Trying to put me to sleep like Zola. My people know when I bend the bomb, just take that bomb to go up. That roll call for my underdogs, think we under y'all and y'all so long. We get no breaks and no kick gas, and you wonder why we didn't broke off. Cause we don't believe the time broke off. I ain't trying to say we got no flaws. We ain't fight no more wars and we live the life like I told y'all. You can say what you want, but this for sure. We ain't running from nothing, then we gon' be here till the very end. We got that butter, babe. Best believe we got more than that campaign. For that hand to hand, and we hella dope. Afghanistan. This be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, you can Hiroshima. This be the bomb, what we call it, Afghanistan. This be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, you can. Hiroshima, this be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima, this be the bomb, what we call it, Afghanistan, this what y'all want, huh, I got the whole world with up, hoes off, that dope ish, and I'm dope trick, so don't make catch me a dope talk, and I heard the fans set me on tap, and on me and all of my road off, they pick up the phone like, now that's what I call a cold call, and we live in the land of the legal G's, and the gig country try to prolong, cause I'd hold you down, I might hold you up, only cause y'all hold on, and the same ones that use the hope for change, this house down when that hoe go, they take your rights and it's so wrong, and wonder why they get told on. Cause me, you can say what you want, one thing's for sure. We ain't running from nothing, then we gon' be here to the very end. We got that butter, babe. Best believe we got more than that campaign for that hand in hand, and we hella dope. Y'all can say what you want, one thing's for sure. We ain't running from nothing, then we gon' be here to the very end. We got that butter, babe. Best believe we got more than that campaign for that hand in hand, we hella dope. Afghanistan, this be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, you can. This be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, what we call it, Afghanistan. This be the bomb, you can. Woo! This be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, you can call Hiroshima. This be the bomb, we're gonna break down like this. Afghanistan.